All right, so we're going to get going here. Um, for those of you in the front, there is something crawling around up here. <laughs> Don't stare at it. It will get you. Um, <laughs> It's, oh, it's a surprise. It's a surprise for a few minutes from now. Um, uh, something reasonably slow. Uh, all right, so I'm Jonathan Eisen. Uh, I'm one of the professors for BIS2C. Um, and welcome to uh, Section B for BIS2C. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, go through an introduction to the course, some administrative details, and then a little bit of... Uh, biology at the end of today. What I'm going to, I'm going to be lecturing for the first three weeks about for the class. And what I'm going to do is try and right at the beginning get you up to speed in case you've already forgotten the previous lecture um, and give you a little bit of perspective on where we have been and where we're going. So uh, since this is the first lecture where we've been is this 2 b um, you should all have taken that or some equivalent to that. And uh, we're assuming that you remember at least the major points from that uh, class, if not uh, some of the details. So we're going to, when we, we do various things in the class, we're going to assume that you remember the things from bis 2 b and bis 2 a And we'll make, you know, specific points if there's something that you might want to sort of relook at uh, from those classes. What I'm going to do today, again, is this introduction. And then in the second uh, lecture, which is later today, um, so even though it's listed as discussion, we, we actually use it as uh, basically a fourth lecture for the week. Um, second lecture later today, we're going to talk in more detail about phylogenetic trees. What we're going to, um, what I'm going to try and do for every lecture is give you an outline of the lecture itself. And what we're going to do again today is go through a little bit of an overview of the class and then a bunch of administrative details. You'll get to meet the various people in the course. And then I'm going to go through, after that, an introduction to phylogeny in the tree of life and take you through some details about phylogenetic trees, which is going to lay the groundwork for many of the future lectures in the class. Um, for these, when we get to the, the science topics for the lectures, um, the main required reading is chapter 22 in the book. Uh, so you should definitely go through chapter 22, and it will set you up and help you understand the next four or five lectures. So again, what I'm going to do is give you this overview of the class very quickly, um, this brief uh, introduction, which is to tell you the point of the class. So this class is biodiversity in the tree of life. And one of the main themes throughout the entire course is the incredible diversity of living organisms on the planet, from the small microorganisms, which I will tell you a lot about in the second and third weeks of the class, um, to the larger, furry, leafy, or um, crawling organisms that might or might not be in that bag over there. Um, and this diversity is amazing. There's all sorts of different morphological, behavioral, functional, biochemical uh, diversity. And the way that um, we're going to go through this diversity, so this is a class about that diversity, but we're going to use a framework to help you understand that diversity and that framework is the tree of life, um, evolutionary perspective and the phylogeny of organisms. And I'm going to go through definitions of all these terms uh, in a few minutes. But that's the big picture of what this class is about. So um, in terms of sort of finer scale detail, what we expect you to understand and learn in the class is a combination of sort of two types of things. they are going to be key concepts that we expect you to learn about. And for example, some of the ones that I'll go through in the next few days in lecture are going to be, what is a phylogenetic tree? How do we use phylogenetic trees to study the diversity of life? Um, how do we infer phylogenetic trees? So uh, how do we figure out when we just have data from, say, modern organisms, what their evolutionary history was? Um, and uh, in general, we're going to talk a lot about what we call tree thinking, which is basically using phylogenetic trees or a phylogenetic perspective to understand biological diversity. So there are going to be these concepts that you will have to sort of understand the big picture of those concepts and how to apply them in various circumstances. But of course, there are also going to be some facts that we expect you to understand as well. Um, most of the things that we go through in lecture, uh, you will be expected to 
to understand the facts of the organisms that we go through, unless you're basically told otherwise. Occasionally we'll, we'll say, I'm going to show you a bunch of detail about this process, but I only want you to understand, say, the big picture, not all of the terms that we're going to give you. Um, but So it's this mix of facts about the biology and diversity of organisms, the history of organisms, and some of their major features that we're going to go through in the class, and again, these concepts. Um, so now what I'm going to do is take a step back from this sort of organization of the course and talk a little bit about administrative details. So for this class, there are three faculty in the course. I'm going to be, so again, I'm Jonathan Eisen, and I'm going to be doing the first three or so weeks in the class. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist. My home department is evolution and ecology in the College of Biological Sciences. But I also have a, a, an appointment in the medical school in this Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. And my lab is where I do my research is in the Genome Center, uh, which is a building on the west side of campus for just past the stadium. And what I do is study the evolution of microbes and their genomes. And I do a lot of work related to sort of microbial diversity in and on people, in and on plants and animals, and in the environment, in particular in extreme environments like the bottom of the ocean or boiling hot springs and uh, things like that. And so the other two faculty in the course are here, and they're going to give you a little introduction to who they are. The first is Brian Moore. The second is going to be Brad Schaefer. And Brian is going to do basically the second third of the course, so weeks four through six. And Brad Schaefer is going to do the third third of the course, basically weeks uh, seven through, through nine. And then there'll be a little wrap-up where we may all uh, mix together uh, back at the end. So if Brian can uh, come up here and at least introduce yourself. You'll see him up at the front uh, for lectures, but you won't see him giving uh, lectures for a little while. Yeah, I'll be seen but not heard for a while. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Brian Moore. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm a relatively new faculty at Evolution and Ecology with these guys. Uh, I'm a plant phylogeny person, um, which means my research program is kind of, um, has two main components. One is to develop statistical methods to actually estimate phylogenies, so develop models to infer phylogenies mostly from molecular sequence data. Uh, and the other part of that is to actually make inferences from phylogenies. So phylogenies are the sort of fundamental pattern of evolution, and from that pattern we can make inferences about various uh, evolutionary processes, right? Things like speciation, extinction, how characters evolve, how species achieve their geographic range, and so on. And uh, we can make those inferences from phylogenies using uh, statistical methods. The other part is applying those methods to flowering plants to understand sort of major evolutionary questions about um, plants. So I'll be talking to you about uh, the two major sort of overachieving lineages in the tree of life, uh, plants and fungi. Uh, and then I'll be handing it off to Brett. All right, I need to get my bag. Where did it go? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Could you pull that out for me? It's, oh, God. I kind of hate to reach under your seat. Brad has to have props. That's right. Brad needs props. He's, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, he's going to make the other one. I tell you what, here, you get up and move, and I will get up. There we go. There. <clears throat> I always travel with a bag. Um, so, my name is Brad Schaefer, and uh, and uh, like Brian and, and Jonathan, I'm a professor in the Department of Evolution and Ecology in the College of Biological Sciences. Um, I'll be doing the third part of the, of the course, um, which is animals and, uh, or metazoans. Um, my own feeling is, is that, you know, if we took a poll right now and asked you, you know, what do you think are the coolest group of organisms, animals, plants, or the little stuff, most people would say animals, I would agree. So I get to do, I get to do the really interesting part of the course. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been here at Davis for uh, a long time, for 24 years. Um, I am a very much an empirical practicing phylogeneticist. I work primarily on vertebrates, and I work primarily with invertebrates on reptiles and amphibians. Um, and thus the, the point of uh, my traveling bag here. Um, so I just thought I'd show this to you just because, I mean, why not, right? Um, so this is a turtle. Uh, this happens to be a turtle that um, 
is peeing on me, but um, <laughs> this, this happens to be a turtle. <laughs> but girl, I, I trained her to do that. Um, <clears throat> this happens to be a turtle that uh, the folks in my lab caught uh, yesterday afternoon out in the UC Davis Arboretum, which is a wonderful resource, by the way. It's actually a wonderful resource primarily for plants. Uh, it has living representatives of, of many of the uh, major groups of plants from around the world out there, and it's a really cool place to go. It also has a very healthy population of turtles. This is an introduced one from the southeastern U.S., and we're doing some studies on, the, on how these interact with the native turtles, which is a, is a threatened species, which are also out there, and, and because there's a lot of introduced turtles because people let their pets go. Uh, she also happens to be the second largest turtle we've ever caught in the Arboretum in 24 years of working out there, so she's a, she's a very cool gal. Um, anyhow, my research, uh, as I said, is, is mostly uh, has to do, with, it's my gym bag too, so she's been all over it. Um, anyhow, uh, my research mostly has to do with um, speciation, phylogenetic history, and the evolutionary biology of amphibians and reptiles, primarily salamanders and turtles. Um, also, I should say, I'm um, a big part of my life, and an increasingly big part of my life, is conservation biology. And so, especially in the last part of the quarter when I'm teaching, um, it's kind of a theme that I'll come back to over and over again, is as we're marching through a lot of the diversity of, of, in the animal world, and um, some of the fascinating adaptations and, and patterns of diversification that we see around the globe, uh, there's also a lot of important conservation concerns that I'll bring up. Uh, for example, turtles, uh, you may or may not know, are, in terms of large groups of vertebrates, turtles um, have a higher fraction of species threatened with extinction than any other group of, uh, of animals. Uh, the number two group is sharks, but the number one group is turtles. So anyhow, things like that I'll, I'll talk to you about a lot. Um, right, so, so that's me, and um, I'll be in here for the last third of the quarter. Uh, talking to you about animals, okay? Uh, I, I was going to say that we've planted other ones all around the, the room, but that's not true. Uh, um, all right, so uh, what I'm going to do here is now uh, introduce you to some of the course staff, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about um, what they do. Uh, here, um, actually, John Koza, John Koza, who's the course coordinator, he's really the person um, you should go to with questions about details about the class. Uh, he, he's coordinating the labs, but he also knows a lot of the details about things like um, when the labs are going to be, how to sign up for various things. Um, Corin Sandu over there in the corner. Uh, is going to handle registration things, so if you have particular requirements related to CRN numbers and things like that, she's the person that you should go to. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to introduce the TAs who are here and tell you a little bit about the lab. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, okay, so first, um, um, I just want to reiterate that um, I'm basically here to help you to have the best experience in the course, particularly the lab, so anything that you need help with or that you're not sure who to ask, ask me and I'll either find, I'll either help you or I'll find out who can help you. Um, uh, and I'm sure I'll be seeing a lot of you all in the labs and in the uh, resource center and whatever. I just wanted to, oh, let me introduce the TAs first, yeah. So are there any TAs here that um, are not in the front now. So most of our TAs, I guess, couldn't make it today. They're, you know, they, they have classes and they have um, research projects that they're doing, but a few were kind enough to make the huge effort to be with us. And so let me introduce them. Uh, Melody Schmidt and Alex Van Dam, Annabelle Kleist, and uh, Eric Lee. And you may have them as your TAs, or you may have others, but the one thing I will say is that it's an all-star team. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. And Chris, most of you. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, they're an all-star crew of TAs, and um, they're going to basically be, your TA is going to be your guide as we explore 
the tree of life. So it's probably the person that you'll get to know the best in this course. Um, okay, so that said, we have a few nut and bolt things to do about the lab. Um, first of all, they have, the profs have not yet decided whether they're going to use clickers. But if they do, I just wanted to uh, remind you that especially since so much of this course takes place on Fridays, and at some point you may have a friend come to you and say, hey, could you carry my clicker to class and then pretend that you're me and ans answer questions on my clicker? Don't even think of doing that because we're going to see you and we'll bust you and then not only will the friend who had the clicker uh, be sent to student judicial affairs, but so will you as the owner of the clicker. So please don't make us have to go through that. Um, that said, we may not use the clickers. It depends on what the profs decide. Okay, the rest of it's going to be about lab. First of all, um, there's a new manual this quarter, and it's being offered only at the bookstore, and it's got a picture of a frog on the cover. So if you've seen a manual, if you have a manual, secondhand one, that doesn't have a frog on it, that's out of date. Uh, don't use it. Be sure to get the new one from the bookstore, OK? And uh, has, has anyone already obtained it from there? OK, good. So they definitely have one. OK, the first lab meets next week. And I've already sent out an announcement about that. Please, if you see an announcement or an email from John, always read it. No, uh, no PDS, what I call PDS premature deletion syndrome. You've got to read those. There's always going to be something important about the course. Um, so, this, so the first lab, it'll meet for the full three hours, because not only will we handle enrollment, but also you'll jump right into uh, the first lab about tree thinking. Uh, and I would plan to stay the whole three hours for every lab. It's a lot to do. Um, if you leave early, you'll miss some of it. Um, the practical exam, I'm going to write that. And I guarantee that it's going to be about what's in the lab and not what's in the manual. So you really have to be there, experience it. And it's going to be really cool, because there you'll see the, the living organisms alive and real. Um, you'll have a lot of things that you can do with your hands. It's really hands-on. So it's an experience you don't want to miss. It's a lot of fun. It's a really cool lab. Um, then we've got the, the TAs have, have been signed, and that schedule is in the uh, resources department of SmartSite. So just go there, find out who your TA is going to be. Um, for the first lab, which will be Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, depending on who you are, you've got to be right on time. Um, the reason why is especially for the A sections, they're full and there are people on the wait list. So if you don't show up, guess what's going to happen? So make sure that you show up to your section. That said, is there anyone who as of now is on the wait list? Anyone here? OK, so maybe we've solved this problem. Maybe that would not idea. Right. This, this, OK, that's right. OK, so no one's going to be on the wait list here. There's room in most of your sections, but still, show up for the first time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, OK, what's next here? So um, about switching sections. Um, first of all, don't do it unless you absolutely have to. But um, the roster will be open, and you can just uh, uh, switch in the usual way. Um, up until Sunday night. Then Monday morning, we're going to lock down the roster, which means that any changes have to be made through Horan. And the way it'll be done is um, she's going to be out in the hall for the first lab before it starts and right at the beginning. And she'll be ready to hand you your permission to add numbers, provided that there's room for the section that you want to get into. If there isn't room, then You'll just stay where you are. Okay. So are there any questions about how to handle enrollment issues or anything like that? OK, and so Huren will be your go-to person for that. She knows everything about it. Um, all right, about the pre-labs, I saw that some of you had already started work on your pre-labs. That's good. 
Um, I'll be back in the CLC uh, right after this class if for any last minute questions that people may have. Um, the pre-lab is due 9 a.m. Monday, sharp, 9.00. Uh, and that means uh, preferably submitted online, but if you run into trouble with submission, then you can, you can uh, as a last resort, take your manual copy, because we'll, you should fill it out first in the manual, and then slide that under the door of the CLC. The CLC is 3089. Uh, of the Science Lab building. And that's basically your uh, BIS-2C clubhouse and your study center. We have a lot of resources there to help you. Um, but it's also the place you bring the pre-lab in a pinch. Um, I would suggest that you do the pre-lab as early as possible. That way, if there are any problems with submission, you'll have time to try again. Or uh, if it's, you know, if there is no more time, you'll still have time to carry it over in hard copy. Um, you also have time to ask us questions if you do it the week before, which I recommend. Um, oh yeah, there is a document called as Lab Policies and Pre-Lab Instructions in Resources in SmartSite. Please read that thoroughly as soon as possible because that has all the rules for um, lab attendance and it gives you the exact instructions on how to do the pre-lab. So are there any questions about pre-labs? Okay, and other than that, um, you know, just looking forward to a great quarter. I hope to see you in lab and in the, the CLC. Okay, time for the real stuff. All right, so uh, in, in terms of the clickers, uh, we're still trying to figure out if the software is going to work on all of our computers with updates to operating systems. The clicker software that we use here is not highly maintained, so it's pretty buggy when operating systems get updated. So we're st that's why we're still working it out, and it just we don't have an answer yet, but we're trying. We would like to use them. It's just not clear if it's going to work. Um, all right, so a little more administrative detail. Um, I assume you know where the section is meeting, but I'm just going to go over it again. For the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at this hour, we're always meeting in here. And in addition, again, as I said at the beginning, although some people may have come in late, um, the discussion section is really a, a fourth lecture, basically. And that's in here uh, from 6.10 to 7 p.m. Uh, for my lectures, I'm going to try and make it a little bit not so lectury. Um, but, for example, at the beginning tonight, you will see a movie uh, for a few minutes, a geeky, dorky evolution movie, but still um, a movie. Um, so, so that's what's going to happen uh, many of the, the night sections, but we're going to have midterm number one in the night section on October 14th. So that's going to cover the material that I'm going to cover in the class, basically, the first three weeks of the class. And then midterm number two is going to be the night section on November 4th, and that's going to cover the second third of the course that um, Professor Moore is going to cover with plants and fungi. The final exam for this section is Thursday, December 8th, uh, 3.30 to 5.30. And that's going to cover um, the material that Brad Schaefer will talk about in animal evolution, um, and in addition, a little bit of material from the previous two sections. So you can view it like a third midterm in part. So uh, third midterm for the animal stuff, and then a small portion of the final will cover everything in the class. So I, I assume everybody is getting more and more familiar with SmartSite. We will use SmartSite for all sorts of uh, distribution of things for the class, the podcast. So we're recording audio for all the lectures. Those will be posted there as soon as possible. Uh, sometimes the next day after a lecture, or sometimes that day, depending on how, how it goes with the TAs taking back the, the disc with the recordings and uploading it. Um, lecture slides will be posted, at least for my lectures, I'm going to try and post them the afternoon or evening before uh, the day of class. And uh, those that get posted also in SmartSite. Um, uh, we will try and look at the chat room if you have questions. Uh, John's been looking there. I've been looking there. Um, that's probably the best place to get 
sort of rapid answers from a diverse collection of people. The TAs occasionally look in there too. Um, and office hours, this was not posted or maybe posted now, but the faculty are going to have office hours Mondays from 1 to 2, also in the, the SLB 3089. Uh, so if you have specific questions for the faculty, that would be the best time to catch us other than right after class. It's, it's in resources. It's, it's list though. All, the entire list of when office hours are and who is going to be there uh, is now listed in the resources section. So the book we're using is the ninth edition of this uh, Sadava book. Um, I assume most people here do not. Does anybody here try to use the eighth edition? Um, the eighth edition is not ideal because there have been a bunch of changes in the ninth edition, and we haven't been using the eighth edition for a little while. Um, so th you should really try and get the ninth edition. There were a significant number of changes in some of the sections, and what we're going to focus on is what's covered in the ninth edition. Um, and it's up to you to figure out what the differences are if you're going to try and use the eighth edition. Is that the one that they're selling at the bookstore? The new one that they're selling at the bookstore is the ninth edition. Yeah. So, um, and that was what was used for the previous versions of 2B. Um, so most people should have had that, been using that one already. And we will send around an email or make an announcement in class if there are other supplemental readings. So I already sort of hinted at part of this, but I'm just going to go through the points before getting into a tiny bit of detail in, in biology. So the course uh, total number of points for the class is going to be 500. For the labs, you're going to, um, uh, the total from the labs is 150 points. 105 of those points come from the lab activities related to each individual lab. There are going to be eight of those. But the lowest one for you will be dropped. So in total, there will be seven that count for a possibility of 105 points. And then there's a lab practical exam at the end of the year, sort of revisits everything you did throughout the course of the year in the lab, and that's worth 45 points. And then midterm number one is worth 100 points. Midterm number two is worth 100 points. And the final is worth 150 points, but you can sort of view it as a third midterm on the last third of the course. That so the last third of the course will be worth 100 points, just like the first third and the second third. And then 50 points of the final will be spread throughout the entire year. Does that basically make sense, how the points are laid out? Um, we already did uh, uh, that part. So if there aren't any administrative questions left, I'm going to go into about 20 minutes on introduction to phylogenetic trees. All right, yeah. The textbook should be on reserve at the library. Um, I can double check, but uh, previous years they've had a few of them on reserve at the library. But I, I, should, I will double check to make sure that they've set that up for this quarter. But I'm 99% I'm sure. Yeah? Are tests going to be based on the lecture or the book? The, uh, are tests going to be based on the lecture or the book? So the tests will be a combination of the lecture and the book. They will not cover material that's in lab, though. The lab practical will cover the material that's in lab. So the lecture and book are sort of a separate track. They run in parallel, so we're covering related material in the lectures and labs. But the stuff that will be on the midterms and the final will be material covered in lecture predominantly, as well as reading parts of the book. For my lectures, I'm going to tell you when there are parts of the book that you really need to focus on. Um, as opposed to parts of the book that are sort of back up to better understand things that are in lecture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are lecture slides posted before or after uh, I, I'm going to post them uh, hopefully the afternoon or the night before the lecture. Um, I'm not so sure about uh, the other two faculty. And I don't know what their strategy is, but I'm going to post them before. All right. So I posted these. I didn't send around an announcement, but I posted. Oh, actually, I may have sent around an announcement at like 1 in the morning. I sent around, uh, I posted them um, for both this lecture and for the second lecture uh, as PDF files. So what I'm going to do for the next uh, 20 or so minutes is go through a brief introduction to phylogenetic trees, um, why sort of some, some of the different aspects of phylogenetic trees, and then give you a layout of the course from a phylogenetic perspective uh, using the tree of life to give you a layout uh, of the course. 
and talk about some aspects of trees, like the fact that most of the trees that we use are actually oversimplifications of full evolutionary history. And then if we have time in the last couple minutes, I'll talk about some uses of phylogenetic trees. So again, going back to these slides that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago, there's this incredible diversity of life in terms of form and function, behavior, morphology, biochemistry, physiology, um, incredible diversity across uh, life in all these different uh, types of organisms. And you know, you've talked about this, I'm sure, in other biology courses. In 2B, they talk about various things about the ecology and evolution of the diversity of life. What we're going to talk about in this class is sort of the organismal diversity of organisms. But we're going to orient that, as I said before, using phylogeny. And this has uh, been pervasive in biology mostly since the time of Darwin. So this is a drawing from Darwin's notebook. Um, and this is the on a reproduction of the only figure that he included in his book on the origin of species. So he thought that phylogeny, the branching pattern, and I'll define this in a second, the evolutionary history of organisms was so important that it was the only thing he drew a figure for in the origin of species. And so um, what I'm doing on this slide is I'm going to define a few of the terms and uh, a few of the things that we're going to talk about for the rest of the lecture and for the next lecture. So when we talk about phylogeny, what we mean is the evolutionary history of organisms most of the time. Sometimes we will use phylogeny to refer to the evolutionary history of parts of organisms, say individual genes. Individual genes can have their own history, and we'll see something about that later. But most of the time, we talk about phylogeny of species. And we may talk about phylogeny, but if we want to show you what we mean by phylogeny for particular organisms, we draw that in this diagram called a phylogenetic tree. And I'm going to show you what those look like and define all the different parts of a tree in a second. Um, and in most of the class, we're going to show you a small component of a phylogenetic tree. But all organisms can be related to each other in something called the tree of life. That's a phylogenetic tree of everything on the planet. Most of the time, we're going to show you a small part of the tree of life, say the turtles, or the bacteria, or some other group of organisms. But behind all of that is a tree that represents the evolutionary history of all organisms. And um, in chapter 22, there's a lot of background on this. I'm uh, not going to expect you to learn all of the extra things in chapter 22, but if you feel like you're getting confused at any times during my lectures, Chapter 22 is a really good sort of overview of phylogeny. So what I'm going to do now is take you through a phylogenetic tree. You really have to understand how to read and interpret phylogenetic trees. This is done a lot in lab one, and it's also going to be critical to the rest of the class. So I'm doing it sort of slowly and carefully at the beginning to really make sure you understand uh, the different parts of a tree. So um, in the book and in much of the class, the phylogenetic trees that we're going to use look a little like this. This is what's called a horizontal tree. And horizontal trees are trees where um, time is represented or the divergence of organisms is represented on the x-axis along the horizontal axis. And um, almost always when you do this, the earlier times are on the left side. So if we look at this tree, this branch represents a branch leading up to the common ancestor of all of these organisms here. This is also known as the root branch of a tree, and I'll come back to this uh, in the second lecture uh, later today to really get you to understand uh, the different parts of a tree. But if we start at the beginning of this tree, we can imagine an ancestral species of, or uh, of organisms that at some point split into two descendant lineages. This is why we call it a branching event and why we use this tree-like structure to represent phylogenetic history because there are these splits from one, from one lineage into two lineages. In this tree, it represents multiple splitting events. So there was a split here, a split here, and a split here. These splits are also called nodes in the tree. The nodes represent both splitting events of a single lineage into two lineages, as well as 
if you travel from the right side of the tree backwards in time, the common ancestor of a set of organisms to the right of that particular node. Many trees that you will see in the class try to represent time on the x-axis. And so if it represents time on the x-axis, you can compare, say, a point here, draw down to the axis, and figure out what time that event happened in the past. In many cases, we don't have good information about time. And so the time is erased from the x-axis, and we just talk about the pattern of branching events. We may know the order of events, but not the timing, the exact time when they occur. OK, so what I'm going to do now is that what I just showed you was what we would call a simplified phylogenetic tree. Almost all the trees we're going to use are going to be things that don't represent the real history of organisms. And I'm going to show you two examples of oversimplifications that happen when we draw evolutionary trees. One relates to populations within species, which are generally not shown on these trees. And another relates to having more branches than we actually show when we draw the phylogenetic tree. So in terms of populations, if you drew the real history of organisms, you would have to draw the populations within species. You should have talked about this extensively in 2B. So within a species, you have populations of organisms. They are interbreeding with each other. Genes are moving around within that population, mixing and matching to create new combinations, say by sexual reproduction. And um, that sort of population genetics uh, uh, stuff happens within the population of an organism. So many different individuals within a species. If that lineage splits into two descendant lineages, as I've drawn here, the descendant lineages are also populations. They also have lots of mul multiple individuals also with genes mixing and matching within those populations. <coughs> this is way too complicated for us to represent when we do evolutionary history of, say, 2,000 species. It's just way too fine scale level of detail. So what we usually do is you can take this concept of the populations and draw simplified branches that represent sort of the core of these lineages. We throw away the populations. We don't show those, but those are there. We're just not showing them. And then we can draw a node on this tree to represent the split event in this population. It is never as clean as we show it like this, but this is just the only way we have to make sense out of uh, organisms is to reduce the complexity and represent it this way. Does that basically make sense, what you're doing here? So this can be extended to more and more species. So if we have four species here, each of those have populations, and their ancestors had populations. So we can draw those simplified branches on this entire population history, throw away the population history again, add nodes to this tree, and now we have a phylogenetic tree but it is an oversimplification of the true history of those species. And this is going to be really important for some parts of the class when we talk about some complexities in phylogenetic history. Basically makes sense? All right, so um, in terms of these organisms, this, is, this applies across the tree of life, although it applies a little bit more to, say, plants and animals which have large populations of organisms with lots of recombination. So for the chimp, human, gorilla, orangutan tree, again, these have these populations going on uh, behind the scenes in this tree. So the other oversimplification is that many of the branches in a phylogenetic tree are not shown. So for example, if we take this tree with chimps, humans, gorilla, and orangutan, in reality, there actually are multiple other lineages of these organisms. There are at least, according to many people, two or maybe even three species of chimpanzee. Um, depending on you know, whether you like other people or not, you might say there are multiple species of humans around. Um, gorillas, there are probably two or three species of gorillas. And orangutans, there, I'm not sure if there are more than one. But there are many other lineages that are not always represented when you say you're studying the evolution of, say, chimps, humans, orangutan, and gorilla. 
In addition, we don't always show the extinct lineages. So there are many lineages that branched off in the past that we have maybe no data for right now, but they were there in the past. If we have fossil data, we can represent some of these extinct lineages, and you will see this later in the course when we talk about fossil information. So you can draw extinct lineages on a phylogenetic tree, but they're frequently not included. And of course, you combine the two. So there were populations for each of these lineages, many branches not shown, extinct lineages. The tree that we actually represent is a real oversimplification. What the point of much of the rest of the class is about is those simplified trees turn out to be incredibly powerful and useful for all sorts of purposes. And that's why we use them. But again, they, they, aren't, they don't represent everything that happened. So what I'm going to do now is basically use a tree of life to take you through the topics of the course to show you why you know, they're organized this way. So this is uh, the big tree of life uh, that we're going to use throughout uh, much of the first few weeks of the class, um, where there are three main lineages of organisms on the planet. They are now called domains, the domains of life. The eukarya, also known as the eukaryotes, that is the organisms with their DNA packaged in a nucleus. And then two separate lineages of organisms that do not have a nucleus, the archaea and the bacteria. And this is the big picture of the tree of life, these three main branches in the tree of life. And we'll get into all sorts of detail about this in, in the second week of the class. This is, of course, a simplification. These aren't even species that are represented here. This is entire lineages. There are hundreds of sub-branches, if not thousands to millions of sub-branches within each of these, representing all of the kingdoms, the, the phyla, the orders, the families, etc., of each of these lineages. But this is what we're going to do when we talk about the big picture of the tree of life. We're going to throw all of those away and represent the order of branching among the domains of life. For the course, it's helpful to zoom in on the eukaryotic branch and expand it a little bit. So I've expanded it into a few other lineages for eukaryotes. And what we're going to do for the course is in the first week, we're not going to talk a lot about each of these components of the tree. We're going to talk much more about phylogenetic trees themselves and how we infer them and the details of phylogenetic trees. In the second week, we're going to focus on the bacteria and the archaea in the tree. We're going to zoom in on those branches and talk about some of the evolutionary events within those lineages. We're going to talk a lot about, for example, bacteria that are associated with people. We're going to talk about organisms that live and thrive in extreme conditions. We're going to talk about a variety of things related to these organisms. In week three, we're going to focus on the eukaryotes that are not plants, animals, and fungi. They are generally called microbial eukaryotes because most of them are microorganisms. That is, we can't see them without a microscope. There are some exceptions to that. So kelp is one of the lineages that we will be talking about, even though it is not a microorganism. It's very large. Um, but it is in these other groups that are not plants and animals and fungi. So we're going to talk about those uh, lineages in week three. And then uh, Brian Moore is going to take over and talk about plants in weeks four and five and fungi in week six. And Brad Schaefer is going to take over and talk about animals in weeks seven through nine. And then in week 10, we're going to talk about some interactions among these different groups, as well as sort of re recapitulate some of the more important topics in the class. So that's sort of a phylogenetic perspective on the course itself. And what I'm going to do in the last uh, couple of minutes here is now take you through a few relatively simple examples of using phylogenetic trees. That is why, sort of the point of this phylogenetic orientation to the class. Why do we care? Many people care about evolutionary history itself. That is what events happened on the planet. Most of what we're going to talk about in the class is using the evolutionary history to learn something about modern organisms or about major events that have happened related to features or physiology or behavior, et cetera, of organisms. So here's an example you may have heard of a few times. 
Uh, this is an evolutionary tree of a group of birds, generally known as Darwin's finches. These are finches that live on the Galapagos Islands. And when Darwin went there, this was one of the things that related to his thinking about natural selection, what he observed on the islands in terms of the different finches. The important thing in terms of phylogeny here is that the birds on these different islands look very, very different on the outside from each other. Their beaks have changed extensively. Their size is actually pretty different uh, between the birds on the different islands. But in fact, they are all members of a single subgroup of finches. They're all actually very closely related to her, each other in evolutionary history. And all of these changes happened in a short period of time, in terms of evolutionary time, on these islands as these birds colonize these different volcanic islands. The phylogeny helps us learn that this is not, that the, the, the differences here are not because the organisms are just very distantly related from each other. The differences relate to diversification that has happened in a relatively short period of time. That's the main use of the phylogeny in this case. So another thing that we will talk about later in the class um, is, for example, phylogenetic trees of birds and reptiles and dinosaurs indicate that birds are actually evolving from within a subbranch of reptiles. That subbranch that they evolved from within appears to be the branch that includes dinosaurs. So even though people say dinosaurs have all gone extinct, they really haven't. They are birds. So we will talk about what that means, why evolutionary biologists want to call birds basically a form of dinosaur, and why that's important to understand uh, later in the class. Again, the phylogeny is what allows us to do that. Um, one thing that I will talk about, I didn't mention this in the outline, I will also talk a little bit about viruses, and I'm going to give you two quick examples of things that we will talk about later in the class. One is this phylogenetic tree, which is really interesting, of immunodeficiency viruses, including uh, HIV strains, so HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and SIV strains for simian, or ones that infect certain types of monkeys, Simian immunodeficiency virus. And when you build an evolutionary tree of these viruses, you actually see something that people did not expect. The two, strain, two major lineages of HIV show up in different parts of the tree. They do not share a common ancestor with each other. There were two separate origins of immunodeficiency viruses that basically went from infecting monkeys to infecting people, rather than a single origin. This is really important because drug treatment for some of those strains is, actually turns out to be a little bit different because they're somewhat distantly related to each other. And understanding the evolutionary history is important for things like modeling infectious disease dynamics, understanding how to treat and prevent some of these infections. And then the last example I will uh, give you this uh, afternoon, um, it relates to flu viruses, which unfortunately Many of you probably have already been exposed to uh, this year. Uh, if you can't tell, I have a bit of a cold, but I think I'm, I've had it over it, so I hope not contagious right now. Um, uh, evolution of flu is really, really interesting. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. The flu virus has eight um, different segments of its genome, and those different segments of the genome encode for important proteins in the flu virus. When a single individual is infected with two different strains of flu viruses, those different segments can mix and match to produce a recombinant descendant flu virus, which is sort of like sexual reproduction in plants and animals. Many people did not imagine that viruses like flu viruses would be able to do this. The evolutionary analysis helps us interpret that and was, for example, used extensively during the swine flu outbreak to figure out what was going on in the epidemiology of flu. Uh, people were building evolutionary trees of flu viruses to figure that out, and we will spend a little bit of a lecture talking about that. So that's uh, it for now.